So chapter 11, Leviticus. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, These are the living things that you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Whatever parts the hoof and is cloven-footed, and choose the cud among the animals you may eat. Nevertheless, among those that chew the cud or part the hoof, you shall not eat these. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not part the hoof, is unclean to you. And the rock badger, because it chews the cud but does not part the hoof, is unclean to you. And the hare, because it chews the cud but does not part the hoof, is unclean to you. And the pig, because it parts the hoof and is cloven-footed, but does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. You shall not eat any of their flesh, and you shall not touch their carcasses, they are unclean to you. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. Everything in the waters that has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, you may eat. But anything in the seas or the rivers that have not fins and scales of the swarming creatures in the waters and of the living creatures that are in the waters is detestable to you. You shall regard them as detestable, you shall not eat any of their flesh, and you shall detest their carcasses. Everything in the water that has not fins and scales is detestable to you. And these you shall detest among the birds. They shall not be eaten, they are detestable. The eagle, the bearded vulture, the black vulture, the kite, the falcon of any kind, every raven of any kind, the ostrich, the nighthawk, the seagull, the hawk of any kind, the little owl, the cormorant, the short-eared owl, the barn owl, the tawny owl, the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron of any kind, the hoopoe and the bat. All winged insects that go on all fours are detestable to you. Yet among the winged insects that go on all fours, you may eat those that have jointed legs above their feet, with which to hop on the ground. Of them you may eat the locust of any kind, the bold locust of any kind, the cricket of any kind, and the grasshopper of any kind, but all other wind insects that have four feet are detestable to you. And by these you, sh you shall become unclean. Whoever touches their carcass shall be unclean until the evening. And whoever carries any part of that carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Every animal that parts the hoof but is not cloven-footed or does not chew the cud is unclean to you. Everyone who touches them shall be unclean, and all that walk on their paws among the animals that go on all fours are unclean to you. Whoever touches their carcass shall be unclean until the evening, and he who carries that, their carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. They are unclean to you. And these are unclean to you among the swarming things that swarm on the ground, the mole rat, the mouse, the great lizard of any kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the lizard, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. These are, un are unclean to you among all that swarm. Whoever touches them when they are dead shall be unclean until the evening. And anything on which any of them falls when they are dead shall be unclean, whether it is an article of wood or of, of a garment or a skin or a sack, any article that is used for any purpose, it must be put into water and it shall be unclean until the evening, then it shall be clean. And if any of them falls into any earthenware vessel, all that is in it shall be unclean and you shall break it. Any food in it that could be eaten on which water comes shall be unclean. And all drink that could be drunk from every such vessel shall be unclean. And everything on which any part of their carcass falls shall be unclean. Whether oven or stove, it shall be broken in pieces. They are unclean 
and shall remain unclean for you. Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern holding water shall be clean, but whoever touches a carcass in them shall be unclean. And if any part of that of their carcass falls upon any seed grain that is to be sown, it is clean. But if water is put on the seed and any part of that carcass falls on it, it is unclean to you. And if any animal which you may eat dies, and if any animal which you may eat dies, whoever touches his carcass shall be unclean until the evening, and whoever eats of its carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. And whoever carries the carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Every swarming thing that swarms on the ground is detestable. It shall not be eaten. Whatever goes on its belly and whatever goes on all fours or whatever has many feet, any swarming thing that swarms on the ground, you shall not eat. They are detestable. You shall not make yourselves detestable with any swarming thing that swarms, and you shall not defile yourselves with them and become unclean through them. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law about beasts and birds and every living creature that moves through the waters and every creature that swarms on the ground to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean and between the living creature that may be eaten and the living creature that may not be eaten. nod from Sam, so I better stand up. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to see you uh, again today. Hope you've had a, a good morning uh, so far. And thanks, Deborah, for making it all the way through 47 verses. Uh, well done. Um, whoever's reading in the next session will have a much easier task. There's only eight verses. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, why don't I pray, though, and ask that God would help us as we consider a part of the Bible that may be unfamiliar or strange. Um, Raise lots of questions. Uh, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for opportunity to gather again this afternoon as your people to open the scriptures together and to be able to do that uh, safely. Uh, we don't want to take that for granted. We're aware of so many of our brothers and sisters for whom this is just an impossibility. And so we give you praise and thanks for the opportunity we have. And we ask that you would indeed speak to us through your living word. And by the power of your spirit, we ask that you would bring transformation and change uh, where you see fit in our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now, as I said last night, uh, I live in Sydney. I live at Sydney Mystery and Bible College. Not at the college, but literally next to the front gate. It's in Croydon in Sydney's inner west, which is a really fantastic place to go if you like food. You can walk five minutes from the house down to a, a place called Anars where they serve chicken. I don't know what they do with the chicken, but it's magic of some sort. Uh, it just tastes wonderful. You can go another five minutes down to Ashfield, the other direction, and sit down to a, a sumptuous feast of dumplings and shallot pancakes and jasmine tea, and then head across the road to the next suburb and kind of wash it down with a macchiato uh, and an Italian-made uh, gelato. It's just a wonderful place to live with all these different kinds of foods uh, that you can sample, although maybe not always good for the waistline. And I think as a society, we've become an incredibly food-savvy people, haven't we? If you don't believe that, if you don't think that's true, then I suggest you go home uh, and type food into Netflix and see what comes up. Uh, the list is incredibly long. Street food, festive food, Food on the go, the final table, the chef's table, million pound menu, sugar rush, 
You say, no, I don't want any of that. I'm just going to turn on the TV instead. And it's MasterChef and Hell's Kitchen and the Great British Bake Off. And even if you go downtown and stroll into Whitcool's, down one side of the aisle, every recipe book known to mankind filled with sumptuous pictures that trick you into thinking, I can make that, and then you realize you can't. And then down the other side of the same aisle, books filled with weird and wonderful and wacky diets, presumably to help you lose the weight you put on from trying out all the different cookbooks, which, if you think about it, is actually a genius uh, plan, isn't it? Uh, no matter who you are, what day of the week it is, what stage of life you're in, you always need something from that aisle. Uh, a cookbook to inspire you to new culinary heights, then a diet book to lose the weight you put on, and then another cookbook because you're so hungry from the diet uh, that you've just been trying. We live in a really food-savvy culture. But are you a food-savvy Christian? Do you go to a food-savvy church? No, I'm not talking about the men's breakfast that we had this morning, which was wonderful. Nor am I talking about the burgers that we're about to have uh, over dinner tonight. Uh, I'm talking about the intersection between food and faith. So I think we can pride ourselves on having Reformed theology. We can pride ourselves on having a, a sound doctrine of justification, a reasoned view of spiritual gifts. But do you have a theology of food? We're physical creatures. We live in a physical world and we need food to survive. And God has made us that way. But does God care what you eat? Is he concerned about what's in your pantries and fridges? Maybe more pointedly, does what you eat impact your relationship with God? Now, New Zealand may be different. You can tell me afterwards if it is. But I suspect we're not really used to thinking about these sorts of questions as Christians. We often tend to think about our relationship with God purely in spiritual terms. And yet, as we saw from Leviticus 1 last night, God is also really concerned about what we do with our bodies. We'll talk more about that later this evening as well. Our physical and spiritual selves can't just be neatly separated. What we do in one sphere has an impact in the other. And Leviticus 11 teases out that dynamic in relation to food. Does God care what you eat? Well, I think even a, a quick skim through the passage, as you listen to Deborah read through it, I think would inform us, wouldn't it, that if you ask an ancient Israelite that question, they'd have to say, yes, God does care about what we eat. In fact, all these instructions here about diet come as a direct word from God. In verse 1, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, say to the Israelites, of all the animals that live on the land, these are the ones you may eat. In verse 9, of all the creatures living in the water of the seas and the streams, you may eat any that have fins and scales. In verse 13, these are the birds you are to detest and not eat. God, it seems, cared quite a bit about what the Israelites ate and didn't eat for dinner. And the chapter, as it was read, proceeds in quite a nice, orderly manner, doesn't it? Like a well-organized pantry. Uh, everything's in the right place. You can find it when you need to go and look for it. Uh, the whole animal world divided into four different categories of creature. You've got animals that live on the land. You've got the creatures that live in the waters. You've got other creatures that can fly. And then you've got the swarming creatures that kind of live in each of those environments. And land animals come first, in verses 3 to 8. Verse 3 says, You may eat any animal that has a split hoof, completely divided, and that chews the cud. Two really simple criteria that even children can use to distinguish between what you can have on the barbecue and what you can't. And some tricky kind of cases or potentially tricky cases are discussed uh, because some animals chew the cud, but they don't have a divided hoof, uh, like the, the camel or the rock badger or the hare rabbit. But others have a divided hoof, but don't chew the cud, like the pig 
and what was Israel's response to be to animals that didn't meet either of these or both having both of these criteria? Well, you can see it in verse 8, can't you? You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. So if you have a camel, you can ride it, you can use it to carry stuff, you can go and feed it, your kids can play with it, but don't touch it when it's dead. And don't put its meat into generically labeled meat pies. Why? Because it's unclean for you. Now, in order to be able to understand this passage, we're going to have to work out what the language of uncleanness means. It's there all the way through. Like, it really is the key word in the passage, particularly as you get into the second half. It's like every third word is the word unclean. I think there are two things that the word unclean doesn't mean. So, first of all, unclean does not mean to be dirty. This passage is not talking about hygiene or health. So I'm sorry to dash your hopes if you're planning to start the next Auckland health fad and start the Leviticus diet uh, and write a book. This passage is not talking about health concerns. It's not some animals are healthy and other ones are unhealthy to eat. It's really not what it's talking about. Second thing that impurity or uncleanness is not talking about is sin. This is not a moral category in this chapter. It's not that pigs are sinful and some kinds of grasshoppers are righteous. It's, it's the, again, the wrong category. It's not talking about sin either. Uh, the concept of impurity or uncleanness, the terms are synonymous here. It's not moral. It's not hygienic. It's something else. So what is that something else? Let me ask you a question. Um, not a question to put your hand up. You'll see why in a second. Uh, but maybe in keeping with the food theme uh, of this passage. So imagine we go for dinner, we're building our burgers. Uh, you've built your burger uh, the way you like it, uh, with the cheese in the right place and everything else. Here's the question. Would you be okay to get your burger and to go and eat it while sitting on the toilet? That's why I said don't put your hand up. Uh, it might be a little bit embarrassing if you, <laughs> if you did. Um, I think instinctively we know that you just don't do that sort of thing, or hopefully you know you don't do that sort of thing. But it's worth asking, like, why? Is it morally wrong to do that? Is it sinful to eat a burger sitting on the toilet? No, it's not sinful, it's not morally wrong. Is it unhygienic? Is it a, is it a health concern? Well, no, you're just kind of using it as a seat. You're not doing anything else. Um, it's an odd seat, maybe, but that's all you're doing. It's not a health issue either. And yet, like I said, instinctively, we know you just don't do that. In fact, we'll make sure our kids don't do it. So convinced are we that you don't do it. And that's the kind of category we're talking about here. It's, it's not a moral issue. It's not a sin issue. And yet it defines something that's just not right. And so we can at least understand the kind of category we're talking about, uh, even if it does seem a little bit strange to us. This language of being unclean or being an impure it's a status, it's a state of being that can apply to a person or a food source here or to a place uh, or an object, something that's just out of place. There's nothing uh, usually harmful or wrong about being unclean unless that is you go near anything that's holy. Because holiness is dangerous for impurity. And that might not be an issue at all, except in the context of Leviticus, a holy God has come to live in the middle of the camp. You're here in your tent. God is over there in his tent. Now you need to know about issues of impurity. Now it matters, because you might encroach on God's holy space while being in an impure state, and that could be disastrous. The end of Leviticus 15, it says, God says to the people, He says, you must keep the Israelites separate from things that make them unclean so they will not die in their uncleanness for defiling my dwelling place, which is among them. And so all of these instructions here in this passage and the one that comes after it are actually here to protect the people. 
God desires to come and live with his people, but God's holy presence is dangerous. And so now God instructs his people how they may safely live in proximity to him, to know when they need to keep their distance, when it's safe to come near. And so if you think about it, these rules, these instructions are actually evidence of God's grace. God graciously tells people when it's safe to come and when it's not. And regarding the land animals here, whatever has a split hoof and to choose the cut is okay. Everything else, though, God says in verse 8, is unclean for you. Verses 9 to 13 uh, move into Richard's favorite sphere, fishing. The animals that live in the sea and the streams uh, and catching them. And again, there's a really easy to understand criterion here in verse uh, 9. Uh, of all the creatures living in the water of the seas and the streams, you may eat any that have fins and scales. But note in verse 10 as well, you, you have the creatures that live in the sea or in the water, but also the swarming creatures that live there. So I think small kind of groups of things that kind of swarm and move together uh, that don't have fins and scales. Uh, verse 11 says, uh, And since you are to detest these, you must not eat their meat. So again, God says there are some potential food sources are off limits. These are off limits for Israel. Verse 13 turns to animals that can fly, and then you get a representative list uh, in, of detestable birds following in verse 20. Or sorry, followed in verse 20 by some flying, swarming creatures that you can eat, four different kinds of locust. So like I said, it, it's a really neatly arranged list, isn't it? kind of moving systematically through the animal world, breaking things into categories. Here's the things that you may eat. Here's the things that you may not eat. Four different kinds of animals, those that live on the land, those that live in the sea, those that live in the air, and then the swarming creatures uh, from each of those spheres. And adding to the aesthetic beauty of the text, all the named examples come in multiples of four. Four land animals that you're not to eat. 20 prohibited birds that are detestable, four different varieties of locusts that you're enabled to eat or allowed to eat. And yet, as you notice the order and kind of the, the way the passage just moves kind of systematically through things, it does raise a question there, doesn't it? And we've been told about swarming creatures that live in the water, swarming creatures that live in the air, but what about swarming creatures that live on the land? There's an Irishman who's moved to Australia. You become very aware there are lots of swarming creatures that live on the land, most of which you've never seen before. Uh, what about those? Like, why aren't they here? Well, that's a good question. Glad you asked. They actually are here. They're just in the, in the next section. When you get down to verse 29, it brings land swarming creatures into focus. Of all the creatures that move about on the ground, these are unclean for you. And notice again how the, the number four appears. You get eight named examples of land swarming creatures. And there's similar sorts of boundaries here. Uh, verse 31, of all those that move along the ground, these are unclean for you. Whoever touches them when they're dead will be unclean till evening. And if you think about it, that's probably a good thing. I'm not sure many of you are wanting to sign up to a gecko burger. Uh, as you build your burger uh, after this session. It seems like the author doesn't like these animals much either because these land-swarming creatures are singled out above all the other creatures that are here in the passage. We've already talked a bit about the arrangement of, of chapter 11, but really you'd, you'd expect to find this discussion of land-swarming creatures appearing after verses 3 to 8. That's where land animals are talked about. So why is it not there? Why is it here? Certainly drawing our attention to these kind of creatures for some sort of reason. Uh, they've been separated off by themselves. They've also been given the longest bit in the whole uh, passage from verse 29 down to 38. Uh, again, drawing our attention to these particular kind of animals. Uh, but even more than that, these are viewed as being the most supremely defiling of all the animals. I mean, look at the effect that they have from verse 32 on. Not only are these creatures to be regarded as unclean, they make other things unclean. 
In verse 32, if one of their bodies touches something made of wood or cloth or hide, that thing becomes unclean. In verse 33, if one of them falls into a clay pot, you need to smash the pot. They can ruin food and drink and pans and ovens. These land-swarming creatures, separated off by themselves, given the longest section in the whole passage, presented as being more defiling than any other creature. And in verse 28 and 39, bracketed by discussions of death. Can we get the hint that the author is drawing our attention to these creatures for some reason? And maybe he just didn't like the idea of pet rats but we suspect there's something more going on here. What might that be? What's the deal with these land-swarming creatures? Well, again, great question. Glad you asked. I think the answer begins to emerge when we get to the final part of the passage in verses 41 to 47. Here at the, the climax of the chapter, the only creatures that are being talked about are those that swarm on the ground crawl about. Again, they're being singled out. And remember, the prohibited land animals were classified as being unclean. The prohibited uh, sea creatures, water creatures, and birds were given a stronger word. They're detestable. These land-swarming creatures, though, uh, are both unclean in verse 29 and detestable in verse 41. They're worse than all the other ones. And look at the potential they have in verse 43 where the writer says, do not defile yourselves by any of these creatures. Do not make yourselves unclean by means of them or be made unclean by them. Not only might you make yourself unclean, but these creatures themselves might act to make you unclean. And again, remember what that means. If you become unclean, if you become impure, then you can't go to the tabernacle because the tabernacle is holy space. It's dangerous for somebody who's unclean or impure to go there. And so if you become defiled, if you become unclean, approaching God is off limits. You have to stay away for your safety. And so these land-swarming creatures, more than any other animal, have the potential to separate people from God. And against that background, the plea that comes in verses 44 and 45 begins to make more sense. It sounds really weird when you first read the passage. Uh, now it makes sense, doesn't it? Where God says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves about on the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. You see the point that God is making here? He's holy. And only those who are holy have any chance of safely dwelling with him. And so he says, don't make yourselves defiled, because if you do, then you can't approach. You're barred from his presence. And that's why these instructions are given to Israel, because what they ate would affect their relationship with God. And note the instructions here in this chapter are for everyone, because everyone eats, don't they? You eat, I eat, everyone eats. And these instructions, if you look at the start, it's say to the Israelites, it's everybody, to the men, to the women, to the children, everybody eats, everybody needs to pay attention to this because Yahweh is the God of the entire people. And what are they to do? Well, verse 47 finishes it off for us, doesn't it? Uh, where God says you must distinguish, you must separate between the unclean and the clean between living creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. Relationship with God become, it becomes really clear here, doesn't it? It penetrates into all dimensions of life. For the Israelites, it's not just what you do at the tabernacle that counts. It's what you do at home around the kitchen table that counts. Relationship with God intrudes everywhere. Right down to what you put 
in your lunchbox. And yet, if I guess correctly, I think there's still lots of questions left hanging, aren't there? Lots of things we want to know. Like, why these animals and why not those animals? What's wrong with rock badgers? That's what Will wants to know. What exactly is the problem with these land-swarming creatures? Like, why do they get singled out above all these other ones? Why is so much attention drawn to them? And here, I think, is where another aspect of the, the artistry in this passage really comes to the fore. If you look at verse 42, uh, we read that God says, you're not to eat any creature that moves about on the ground. Whether it moves on its belly or walks on all fours or on many feet, it is detestable. And yet, that phrase in verse 42 in the middle of the verse is really arresting. It's really interesting. And that phrase, moves on its belly. Because it's really rare. That expression only appears twice in the entire Old Testament. It appears here. And it appears in Genesis 3. Where the serpent is cursed and told it will move on its belly. And we can escape past that in English, because we're keen to get to the end of the chapter as quickly as possible, but in Hebrew, that's just really striking. It's a really rare word. It only appears here and there. Uh, your attention is grabbed by that as a reader or hearer. And it's grabbed, and it makes us think about the Eden story and what happened in the garden. There's a connection here between land-swarming creatures and the Genesis serpent. And as we start to puzzle over that and to ponder and think, okay, what on earth is going on with that? Suddenly we begin to see a whole load of other things begin to emerge in this passage. Maybe we remember that we've seen creatures divided into different categories before. Creatures that live on land and sea and in the air in Genesis 1 as well as the swarming creatures that fill each of those environments. In Genesis 1, we read about animals being created according to their kind. And now that phrase reappears again for the first time. And we read that in verse 14, you have the red kite according to its kind, and then the raven according to its kind, and the hawk according to its kind. Even the whole flow of the story in Genesis 2 and 3 begins to be evocative. So remember what happens in the garden. God creates Adam. And then he gives him an instruction. What is the instruction in relation to? What's it in relation to? Food. Here are the things you may eat. Here's the fruit you may not eat. Do not eat it. God warns Adam of the, the consequences of disobedience. Temptation will come through the serpent, a land-swarming creature. Adam and Eve disobey God's command, and they're banished from God's presence by being kicked out of the garden. It's kind of a potted summary of Genesis 2 and 3, isn't it? And yet, think about Leviticus 11 now against that backdrop. God has formed a people for himself and now instructs them about what they may eat and not eat. Here are the foods you may eat. Here are the things you may not eat. He warns them of the consequences of disobedience. Danger will come from the wrong kinds of animals, especially land-swarming creatures. If they disobey, then the people will become impure, unclean. If they become unclean, they'll not be able to go to the tabernacle and be effectively banished from God's presence. Can you see what the author of Leviticus 11 is doing here? He's drawing on readers' knowledge of the garden story to make his point even more sharply. Israel is being pictured as a new Adam, facing the same choice in relation to food. You see, for Adam, food was a mark of fidelity. Here's how you would know if he was being faithful to God or not. And now the same would be true for Israel. Food would be a marker of their fidelity, whether they were being faithful or not. God cared about what Adam ate. God cares about what Israel ate. And what they ate affected their relationship with God. 
Which brings us right back to the question that we started with. Does God care about what we eat? Does what we eat have an impact on our relationship with Him? I suspect our initial answer is probably no. At least we're desperately hoping it's no. We recognize that Israel had food prohibitions, clearly here. But surely Christians don't. I mean, can't we just safely kind of set aside Leviticus 11? Sure, it was interesting to look at on a Saturday afternoon, but we can go home and never think about it ever again. I mean, what's the application of this for us? Surely zero. Well, remember what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, where he says, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. We know that verse well, don't we, I suspect. And yet when Paul wrote that, there was no New Testament. He wasn't talking about the New Testament. He was talking about the Old Testament Scriptures, including presumably Leviticus, because he keeps quoting it. And so when Paul says that Scripture is God-breathed and useful, he's talking about this passage too. So in what ways might Leviticus 11 be useful for us as Christian people? Are there ways in which it might teach us or rebuke us or correct us or train us in righteousness? It's a good place to start, isn't it? They're good questions. Well, maybe a good place to begin teasing some of this out is to think about, well, what is this passage doing? What is the author trying to do here with Leviticus 11? I mean, certainly the author's making assertions about what Israelites could and couldn't eat. That much is clear, isn't it? And secondly, he's demanding compliance. Now, so remember verse 1, these instructions come from God directly to the people. They come with authority. They're not just kind of take it or leave it. Like I said, they're not just health advice. Uh, these are regulations for Israel to obey. And yet, telling us about what Israel could and couldn't eat and demanding compliance is not all that's going on here. Think about the other things that we've noticed. This passage reminds readers about the Garden of Eden. It makes us think about that. It makes us think about Adam and the food prohibition he had and the consequences of his disobedience. It makes us think about that. It reminds us of that. And in doing so, Leviticus 11 reveals that food has always been a marker of fidelity for God's people. From the Garden of Eden through to the base of Mount Sinai. What's on your plate says something about what's in your heart. And in this way, I think the passage sends a warning that readers must learn that food matters to God. That ignoring food prohibitions has consequences. It was true for Adam. It was true for Israel. But Leviticus 11 also invites a different response. It's looking for something different, not a, not a repeat of the garden. It's hoping for something different. Adam and Eve were banished permanently. Here, readers are invited to live differently, to listen to God's command so that they can safely live with Him and enjoy all the blessings of His presence. And so ultimately, the passage even calls readers to become holy as God is holy. So Leviticus is doing a whole load of things, reminding and revealing and warning and inviting and calling, teaching us that food is a marker of fidelity. It invites us doesn't it? To have a theology of food. Food is really important. We need to have a theology of food. And yet, maybe the most pressing question, maybe a question on some of your minds at this point, uh, is this one. Do Christians have food prohibitions? Do we? It's kind of a theology of food 101. We've got to start here, I think, don't we? Now, do we have any food prohibitions? I can see a few hopeful shakes of the head, maybe a little bit frightened about what I'm going to say next. Do, fish, do Christians have food prohibitions? Well, the answer is yes. I mean, think about it. I mean, for a start, greed is off limits, isn't it? Gluttony, and drunkenness. Christians are not free to eat or to drink as much as they want to. 
In fact, Colossians says that greed is idolatry. Paul says that overconsumption is the same as worshipping other gods. That's quite striking, isn't it? That greed is idolatry. Nor, Paul says, are we free to grumble and complain about the food that we do have, whatever that is. So what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 10, he draws on the story of numbers to tell his Corinthian readers, do not grumble like some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. The New Testament also imagines followers of Jesus fasting, denying themselves food in order to set aside time to pray. Presumably, Christians are not free just to sit down to three meals a day, every day, for the rest of our lives, as if we had nothing significant ever to pray about. Nor are you free, it seems, to eat anything that will cause a brother or sister to stumble, even if those things are actually all right in and of themselves. Remember what Paul says, again, Romans 14? He says, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, well, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it's wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. Love for one another will mean that some foods and maybe some beverages are off limits perhaps even permanently. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again. And yet, on the other hand, the same love also compels us to be generous. Christians are not free just to keep all of our food for ourselves and to kind of guard that and never share it. Remember what James says? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to them, go in peace and be warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, then what good is it? Faith by itself, if it's not, accom uh, not accompanied by action, is dead. Not being generous with your food indicates a dead faith. Nor are we free to eat food that's been produced through injustice. I mean, is it possible that we grow fat on food that's produced through effective slavery, even if that's half a world away? Choice morsels sliding down well, uh, delicious to eat, enjoyed at the cost of human blood. What would God say about that? Do Christians have dietary prohibitions? things that are off limits? Well, yes, we do. If anything, we might even have a more restricted diet than Israel did. Restrictions may not look like one-for-one -one correspondence, but they are there. Food matters. What you eat matters. We're physical beings. And holiness is expressed as much bodily as it is spiritually. Leviticus 11, it seems, has much to teach us. Paul was right, wasn't he? This, this part of the Bible is actually really useful for us. Useful for teaching. Useful for rebuking. And certainly this passage, I think, teaches us that as it was with Adam, so it was with Israel, and so it continues to be with us. Food is a mark of fidelity. We're warned time and again, Old Testament and New Testament, to watch what we eat, not for health reasons, but for theological reasons. Every time you sit down to eat, as you lift the fork to your mouth, as you, you face the same question that Israel was. Am I being faithful to God in this moment? God cares what you eat. Maybe it's time for a new diet. 
I wonder if you'd stand with me and we're going to sing a